And the Lord said to Abraham, look and see if you can count the stars in the sky. It is said with the naked eye on a pure and clear night, you can see about a thousand stars. And then with Galileo and the coming of the telescope, you could see over 3,000 stars. And today with the Hubble telescope, the telescope can see about 100 billion stars. And 100 billion galaxies are thought to be part of this incredible universe. Yes, the glory of God manifest in creation. And you heard in the gospel today that moment of glory when Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the top of Mount Tabor, which is a magnificent mountain in the center of Israel, where you can see to the north is Mount Carmel. You can see uh, to the northeast, Nazareth, to the east, the Sea of Galilee, to the south, Jerusalem and the desert, and to the west is the Mediterranean. And it was on this glorious mountain that our Lord was transfigured. His divinity shone through his humanity such that the apostles were overwhelmed. And then they experienced the presence of Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets in which the testimony is now fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And maybe you've had a transfiguring experience, maybe the first time you went to the Grand Canyon or the first time you were on top of our own mountain and experienced the glory of the Sandia and the views in every direction. Or maybe it was in a garden or maybe you were on a lake or a river rafting in the glory of creation, you sensed the presence of the Creator. St. Patrick, who's honored on this day, the 17th of March, was the son of a Roman deacon who grew up in Britain and was out partying with his friends when he was kidnapped. He was taken away, taken across the sea to Ireland, sold into slavery, and for some six years, it was there that he worked as a shepherd boy, a slave shepherd boy. And on those nights, those clear nights, when it wasn't raining in Ireland, and he had a vision of the skies, he had an encounter with the Lord God. You see, his deacon, his father, tried to teach him his prayers as a boy, and those prayers came back to him, and his communion with God took place as he meditated and contemplated in the night. And the Lord showed him that he would have to escape, and so he did, made his way back to Britain, where his family, who thought he had been dead, now saw that he was indeed alive. And now, as a 20-something went off to the seminary, was ordained a priest, eventually made a bishop and sent back to the people who had enslaved him. Can you imagine? He went back to the land of his slavery and, by the grace of God, converted practically all of them, including the Druid priests and the kings of Ireland. What will you do with the glory of God that's been given to you? Think about the shamrock, the three-leaf clover. He would lift it up and ask, how many shamrocks are there? One. How many equal leaves? Three. A way of revealing in the natural world a symbol of the Trinity, if you will. And he baptized so many thousands, it's countless. But as you're baptized, the covenant of which we hear one of the ancient covenants in the Old Testament in the first reading with Abraham, the covenant is sealed in your soul, your covenant with God. Now, what was this covenant relationship about? Well, you see, in the text with Abraham, the Lord used the traditional covenant relationship that one king might have with another for themselves and their kingdoms to make a bonded relationship. They would take the animals, split them in two, put the carcasses aside, and a river of blood would run, and the two kings would walk through that river of blood. And the symbolism was this. If I am unfaithful to this covenant between your nation and mine, may I be split in two and my blood run like this river. Now, God is always faithful to the covenant. What about us? God has made covenant upon covenant with ancient Israel, 
and then one final eternal covenant in the blood of Christ in which you and I share at the altar of God. Will we be faithful to that extraordinary covenant of love? You will recall a great figure in Greek mythology was Helen of Troy, considered the most beautiful woman in history. Helen was kidnapped like St. Patrick, and she also fell into amnesia. She didn't remember her royal blood, her nobility, her beauty. And after years, as a woman lost, one of her old friends found her. He found her on the streets and he sensed it could be Helen, but she was bedraggled and terribly aged. And he went up to the woman and asked her her name. She gave a name he did not recognize. But he said, may I see your hand? Having held her hand years before, when she extended her hand, he saw the palm of Helen. And so he called her name. He said, Helen! And she jumped back. Helen, he said. And as he called her by name, her amnesia disappeared. She remembered who she was. She remembered her dignity. And she was restored to that royal glory. Well, dear friends, God calls you and calls me by name through our baptism. And as God said at the great transfiguring moment, as well as at the baptism of Jesus, this is my beloved son, so God says to you, this is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son. By baptism, we are taken into that royal family of heaven. What did St. Paul say in the second reading today? Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to a royal family. But are we living as the children of so good a God? Do we witness to that in the world? Does anyone see our light? As Patrick brought light to the darkness of Ireland and brought great conversion, so must you and I bring that light into the world. St. John Paul, in the turn of the millennium, wrote a beautiful document that I shared at the parish mission earlier this week called Novo Millenio Eniunte, which means the beginning of the new millennium. And he spoke about the spirituality that is required for us to bring about this springtime of the church. He spoke of this new millennium as a springtime for the church. Now, if you look around, you might say to yourself, it seems more like a winter, doesn't it? How do we call forth that springtime? Well, here he tells us. Pope John Paul said, quote, to make the church the home and the school of communion, that is the great challenge facing us in the millennium which is now beginning. If we wish to be faithful to God's plan, and respond to the world's deepest yearnings. But what does this mean in practice, he asks. Here too, our thoughts could run immediately to the action to be undertaken, but that would not be the right impulse to follow. Before making practical plans, we need to promote a spirituality of communion, making it the guiding principle of education wherever individuals and Christians are formed. A spirituality of communion indicates, above all, the heart's contemplation of the mystery of the Trinity dwelling in us. Just as Peter, James, and John contemplated the glory of God, so you and I must contemplate the mystery of the Trinity dwelling in the soul. And the Pope continues, whose light we must also be able to see shining on the face of our brothers and sisters around us. A spirituality of communion also means an ability to think of our brothers and sisters in faith with the profound unity of the mystical body, and therefore as those who are part of me. This makes us able to share their joys and sufferings, to sense their desires and attend to their needs, to offer them deep and genuine friendship. Just the other night, after the bombing of those mosques in New Zealand, I attended a prayer service at a mosque here in town at the Islamic Center and extended our spirit of communion with them in their moment of suffering. That's what John Paul is saying. We have to extend that into the world, people of faith, right? Because hate is not of God. St. John said it several times, God is love. 
If you hate your brother, you cannot love. God is love. Pope John Paul continues. A spirituality of communion then implies the ability to see what is positive in others, to welcome it and prize it as a gift from God. A spirituality of communion means finally to know how to make room for our brothers and sisters bearing each other's burdens and resisting the selfish temptations which constantly beset us and provoke competition, careerism, distrust, and jealousy. And he concludes, let us have no illusions. Unless we follow this spiritual path, external structures of communion will serve very little purpose. They would become mechanisms without a soul, masks of communion rather than its means of expression and growth. That concludes section 43 of his letter. Masks of communion. Are we wearing masks? Are we pretending to be in communion with Christ and with one another? Is it mere ritualism? Or has it penetrated the heart? Has it penetrated Patrick's heart? So much so that he would go back to the people who had enslaved him and bring them the light of the gospel and convert them to the faith of Jesus Christ. That, dear friends, is our challenge. Once the spirit was taken away from the temple of Jerusalem, as Ezekiel prophesied, Ezekiel chapter 10 and 11 and 12, it was lost. Let us pray that the Spirit not be taken away from our souls, the new temples of the Spirit, lest we be mere shells, mere masks, mere rituals, and rather, rather than the living temples of God's Spirit. Today, let us pray that we might experience this new beginning in our souls and share it with those in such great need in the midst of the darkness of our world, whether it's in a courthouse in Albuquerque or at the Roundhouse in Santa Fe, whether it's in your school or in your neighborhood, whether it's in a nursing home or in a hospital, you and I are asked to be that light. And so I conclude with the beautiful prayer of St. Patrick known as the Lorica or his breastplate. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, and through the strength of his descent for the judgment. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, and the speed of lightning. I arise today with Christ within me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beneath me, and Christ above me. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, and God's wisdom to guide me. Amen.